Can anyone see God? How do you picture him? Throughout history, people have whittled, chiseled, cast images of wood, stone, or metal, or drawn and painted pictures to show how they believe he looks. Represented by idols and icons and characterized by mythology, these man-made gods all reflect human traits and failings, for they are the product of people's imaginations. Artists of the past, such as Michelangelo, portrayed God as an awesome being with a stern expression and white hair, while some works of art portray God looking similar to pictures of Jesus Christ, only with white hair. The gentle carpenter of Galilee, or the gentle shepherd, surrounded by sheep or little children. We too have a picture of God in our minds. Oh, we do not make idols of or objects of wood or stone and metal, but often our idea of God is based upon someone who has been an authority figure in our lives, such as a father or a prominent leader, rather than upon what the Bible tells us about him. Now this is quite natural, for it's easier to imagine God as a man. These images, however, give us only a partial picture of God the Father. Now Jesus Christ represented God the Father when he walked on earth as God the Son. He even told Philip, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, in John 14, verse 9. And the book of Hebrews tells us that Christ is the express or exact image of God's person. In all that he said and did, Jesus Christ faithfully represented his Father. Now many are surprised to learn that the Bible does not describe God the Father. We should understand, however, that any picture of him is limited, for God is a spirit, and we cannot see him with our eyes. In John chapter 4 and verse 24 we read, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Furthermore, the Bible tells us that a full understanding of God is impossible, for he is infinite. Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out! But God recognizes our limitations, and for this reason, he has revealed himself through the Bible and throughout history in ways that accommodate our human inadequacies. In other words, the infinite God chose to manifest himself in ways that we as finite human beings can see, can hear, can picture, and understand. The Bible's detailed descriptions of God's thrones and dwelling places throughout all the ages, that's past, present, and future, helps us to picture and understand God's person more intimately. The Bible clearly tells us that God the Father is the king of all creation, and as king, he sits upon a throne in heaven. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12, it tells us, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom. O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. The Psalms tell us, Psalm 45, verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Psalm 47, verse 7 says, God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. Psalm 95, verse 3 tells us, For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Now, we readily can understand and picture a kingdom with its palace and royal throne, for we have kingdoms, palaces, and thrones in our world. My wife and I lived in the United Kingdom of Great Britain for a number of years. While there, we, were, we saw palaces and thrones and were impressed with the richness and beauty that we saw. 
we even saw the late Queen Elizabeth close up as she dedicated a children's playground near our home. She was regal and gracious with her snowy white hair and signature hat crowning her head. You see, God uses what is familiar to us to help us picture and know him better. In this series of videos, we're going to be focusing on the thrones and dwelling places of God that are revealed in our Bibles so that we can know and understand him better. In this session, we'll begin with God's throne of glory as revealed through Moses and Isaiah. If we stop and think about it, it's amazingly wonderful to realize that the infinitely powerful and awesome creator of the universe would stoop to reveal even a part of himself to finite and puny man. Maybe this is not so surprising after all, for our holy and loving God cared enough to send his son to die for us. How great our God truly is. From the beginning of the Bible to its conclusion, God stresses that he will dwell with men and women in a personal way. From Genesis, when he walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the garden, until the end of the book of Revelation, we learn that one of God's purposes is to dwell with man. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, we read, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. In this verse, God indicates that he will, in the future, dwell or tabernacle with man. God's plan has always been to manifest himself in such a way as to make it possible for human beings to fellowship and dwell with him. Before we consider God's throne of glory, we must lay a groundwork. God instructed Moses to build a tabernacle that would reflect both God's character and his covenant relationship with the nation of Israel. The tabernacle, and later the temple, pictured God's dwelling with his people. Of course, a tent or a temple cannot contain the infinite God, but these structures serve to reveal God's presence among his chosen people. This revelation began with Israel's exodus from Egypt and God's promise to be with and guide the nation on its journey. His presence took the form of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That's Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 19 and in 16, verse 10, tells us that this cloud is the angel of God and represents the glory of the Lord. To both Christian and Jewish people, this visible presence of God is called the Shekinah glory. It is derived from the Hebrew word Shekan, meaning to dwell, abide, remain, or inhabit. And it's exemplified in Exodus chapter 40, verse 35, where we read, the cloud abode Shekan thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. An additional revelation of God's presence occurred in the third month of Israel's journey when they arrived at Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. His presence was revealed in thunderings and lightnings and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that the people that was in the camp trembled. That's Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. While on this mountain, God instructed Moses to build a dwelling place for him. In Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9, we read, And let them make a sanctuary that I, that's God speaking now, that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof 
even so shall ye make it. Clearly, not just any dwelling would do. God wanted his earthly dwelling to reflect his presence in a specific way that would teach people about him. The writer of Hebrews informs us that the design of the tabernacle is a shadow or literally an image cast by an object and representing the form of that object. According to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, the earthly temple would serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. In the Old Testament, the true and only God would not be represented by wood, stone, or metal, but through the tabernacle with its structure, furnishings, and priesthood. God used this as a teaching tool for his people as he dwelt with Israel. Moses was privileged to audibly hear God's voice, first at the burning bush and later on the mount. Moses boldly asked to be given another privilege, to see God's face, to see him face to face. He said in Exodus 33, verse 18, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. You see, Moses thought that he knew God well, but he had not yet fully understood that sinful and mortal man cannot stand in the light of God's awesome and blinding holiness. God responded by telling him that he cannot see God's face. In verse 20, For there shall no man see me and live. With this denial also came a revelation of God's mercy and grace. You see, God placed Moses in the cleft of the rock and passed by while covering Moses with his hand. He did not allow Moses to see his face, but he did allow him a glimpse of his back, according to verse 22. From this incident, we see that as close to the Lord as Moses was, God's glory, his holiness, is in such a contrast to sinful man that it's unbearable to man. Moses had not realized how dangerous it is for sinful mortals to see God face to face. When I was a student at the University of Illinois and studying mechanical engineering, I worked one night at the university's power plant. It was there that I began to grasp what tremendous power and danger is in our electrical system. Until that time, I had taken it for granted that every time I turned on an electrical switch, I'd be safe. You know, if the power company did not modify the power coming from that generator, however, I could have easily turned to carbon. As I stood by the generators, I could feel the power of them shaking the floor. I saw gauges indicating thousands of volts and amps were being generated, tremendous power. Hidden within the floor were the wires that transmitted the tremendous power to the lines outside of the building and then to my dormitory. You see, before entering our homes, a transformer changes the power from the wires outside into a form that we can use with relative safety but each time it is divided and distributed to various customers, some of that power is lost. What we have in our homes is but a small part of the total power. So too, as we try to envision and picture God. Although God is infinite and unlimited in power, he must limit the power that he shows to us because we're flesh and blood. God's holiness is the driving or primary attribute of his glory. The powerful brilliance of God's glory would destroy anyone who is less than perfectly holy. God revealed his glory to Israel through the earthly facsimile of his heavenly tabernacle or dwelling place in heaven. God told Moses to divide the tabernacle into two sections the holy place and the holy of holies. 
the veil between the two sections protected men in the holy place from God's glory in the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies once each year after a week of physical and spiritual cleansing. This taught the Israelites that an ordinary person cannot approach a holy God. He needs instead a sinless high priest. It is wonderful to realize that the same holy God has given us the opportunity to approach him and have fellowship with him through our great high priest, God's own sinless son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For we read in Hebrews 4, verse 15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. John tells us in chapter 1, verse 14, that God, as the Word, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, through our Savior, we can behold God's glory. For the people of Israel, God provided a safe way to meet him through the tabernacle and the temple. In Exodus 29, verse 43, God says, I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Let us now move closer into the tabernacle so that we may gain a better understanding of our holy God through his throne of glory. It is here that we meet not only a powerful holy God, but also a God who offers mercy and grace so that human beings may have fellowship with him and joyfully serve him. God's tabernacle on earth was patterned after his tabernacle or dwelling place in heaven, the place where his throne is located. This is where we begin to create our picture of the throne in the heaven where God dwells. According to Psalm 11, verse 4, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. You see, this is where God the Father, as king, is seated over his entire creation in a way, if you will, that his creation can to recognize his presence. The picture that I'm about to show you is very imperfect. It's subject to the limitations of both PowerPoint and me. Please accept it as an attempt to help visualize what God has described in his word. With this in mind, let us gain further insight into God's glory and throne by tuning in. I mean turning to Isaiah 6 and listening to his eyewitness account. Let us begin by reading chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also. In 740 BC, Isaiah was given a vision during King Uzziah's last year of reign. King Uzziah was a good king, and Israel prospered under his 52 years of rule. Unfortunately, success had gone to his head, for he went into the temple and burned incense, a task that only the priests were allowed to do. He was disobeying God by combining the roles of priest and king without God's authorization, according to 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16. This historical background must be kept in mind as we read of Isaiah viewing the tabernacle in heaven. Isaiah continues, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. It is from this throne that God the Father rules the universe and all the affairs of the earth. The first mention of God's throne is actually by the prophet Micaiah, who said to rebellious Ahab in 
1 Kings 22, verse 19. Hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. By definition, a throne is the seat upon which a king sits to rule and dispense justice, Psalm 47, 8 and Psalm 89, 14. It symbolizes the seat of a governmental authority over a kingdom. Thrones were always placed in a great porch or hall. In the Middle East, it was customary to squat or recline. For this reason, a king would sit on a seat or a throne. The throne symbolized dignity, for it was always elevated to signify authority. You might want to look at 2 Kings 4, verse 10, and Proverbs 9, verse 14. For example, there were six steps up to Solomon's throne, according to 1 Kings 10, 19, and 2 Chronicles 9, 16. According to Isaiah, where we read that he saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. It seems possible that the elevation of thrones is an idea that began with God as far back as Genesis, when God instructed Adam about worship after his fall from the garden. He may have told him prophecies about the future, when God would dwell on earth on a high mountain. The psalmist describes this for us in Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. This is a picture, actually, of the new heavens and new earth. When we get to the Throne of Eternity video, we will understand this prophecy better and the meaning of the sides of the north, a Hebrew idiom signifying the highest point on the earth, or in the case of Psalm 48, on the new earth. As with much record in the Bible, I believe that Adam passed down God's teachings to the generations that followed, and they are recorded for us under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Research into the history of thrones indicates they are always placed on a porch or great hall. God's throne in heaven is placed in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle that is in heaven. Now remember, heaven is just as real a place as this earth and Christ is preparing a dwelling place there for each of us who know him personally as Savior right now. Another name for heaven is the New Jerusalem. It's certainly a real and physical place, for that is the meaning of the Greek word for place found in John 14, where Christ tells us, I go to prepare a place. That's a literal place for you. Someday, at the rapture of the church, will be given glorified bodies like our Lord's, bodies that are physically suited for heaven, bodies that can see God face to face and not die. In Daniel 7, we find a picture of God the Father and the Son of Man as he approaches the Father as the Ancient of Days seated upon his throne. The physical description of his pure white garment and hair in his fiery throne emphasize that this is a place of overwhelming glory and holiness. It is also a place of judgment. We'll consider this throne later. Isaiah continues to witness what he saw by telling us that his train of his garment filled the temple. The train refers primarily to the hem of a royal robe. Above the throne stood or hovered the seraphim, each one had six wings, with twain or two he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. The word seraphim means burning one, and reinforces the image of the flaming throne, perhaps suggesting their burning zeal for God's holiness. Seraphim are God's special angels that worship and serve God and execute his will. We see that in verse 6. 
While they have six wings, they need only two to fly. With four, they show their awe, humility, reverence by covering their faces and feet. In this passage, their number is not specified, but we are told elsewhere in Scripture that four seraphim hover over God's throne as a covering. Originally, this responsibility of covering God's throne belonged to the exalted holy angel whom God addressed as the anointed cherub that covereth, Lucifer, Ezekiel 28, verses 14 and 16. Remember, he was the one who wanted to be like the Most High God. Because God's uniqueness is the essence of his holiness. Exodus 15, 11, 1 Samuel 2, 2, and Isaiah 40, 18, and 25. This assertion by Satan was an attack on the holiness of God. Following Satan's fall and removal from position, God replaced him with the seraphim. They now stand guard over the unique presence of God in his throne in heaven and carry out the responsibility of covering. Since the earthly tabernacle and temple reflected the heavenly, the mercy seat had two cherubim placed over it as a covering. Unlike Satan, who boasted that he wanted to be like God, the seraphim declare God's holiness in Isaiah 6, verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, a more literal translation of the Hebrew would be, the fullness of the earth is his glory. The triad, holy, 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 serves one of two possible purposes. One praises each member of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for being holy. The other possibility is that it expresses the ultimate extent of God's holiness as being infinite. Either is representative of the thought. At this point, notice verse 4. The posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. This should remind us of Exodus 19, verse 18, where we read of Mount Sinai quaking. And then in Isaiah 4, verse 5, we see, and Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in Fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. It is God's voice that shakes the doorposts. I always think of an enormous generator of the university's power plant when I read this, because I can remember standing there, and as it built up its power, the floor started shaking, a tremendous concrete floor shaking. What can we learn from this vision of God? When I was in grade school, the art teacher took my class to the park to draw trees. I was not a very good art student, but my drawings of trees was exceptional and was placed on view for all to see at the school open house. <laughs> yes, it did go to my head, perhaps still goes to my head. I thought I was the world's future expert tree artist until one day. I saw a professional artist's exquisite drawings of trees. In comparison, mine was pathetic. Mine fell far short of perfection. In an even greater way, Isaiah speaks for each of us when he realized how sinful and unholy he was when compared to God. Isaiah was instantly humbled and overwhelmingly conscious that he was sinful and unworthy to stand before the holy God on the throne of his glory in heaven. Isaiah writes in verse 5 of chapter 6, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Notice, he did not try to excuse his actions. He did not try to earn God's approval. He saw his own sin for what it was in the light of God's holiness. It is only when we recognize our pathetic, sinful state that falls far short of God's glorious perfection 
and allow God to cleanse us with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, that we can approach him with confidence. It is at the throne of God's glory that we learn that the king of all creation offers sinful human beings his glorious perfection through Jesus Christ, our Savior. How great our God is. Now may the Lord bless you mightily, and I'll either see you here or in the air.